our wars, our tragedies, our challenges, our survival instinct, the traumas, and the different things that we have had to face take on so many different forms. Yet our need for protection, our love for life, the resilience and the ability to overcome, the want to overcome, can be so similar in human spirit. When I was young, I suffered from intense, intense nightmares, crippling nightmares. And so I would wake up during the night and I would hop out of my bed and jump into my grandmother's bed, careful not to wake her. And so I'd sleep right next to her and just being that close to another human being that I absolutely loved, feeling her warmth brought some kind of comfort, some kind of refuge. When I was 15 years old, my father passed away. And so for the very first time in my entire life, I had a whole big bedroom just to myself that I could sleep in. And of course, the nightmares were there every night to visit me. But more than the nightmares, the window to his bedroom was right by the street, and so if a lover's quarrel would break out and I'd hear a woman screaming or gunshots piercing the air, I would be up, out of my bed, and into my late older sister's bedroom, careful not to wake her. I'd get into her bed and fall asleep. But again, the nightmares would come back. And so just not to get out of my bed and go to my grandmother's bed again, I'd lift my hand and place it just on her back, careful not to wake her. And just the feeling of another human being next to me brought some kind of comfort, some kind of refuge. Sometimes I curse my name because my name means she who strives, she who endures. Against all odds, I was named by my grandmother. My father passed away and he died of AIDS. But I find service and I find honor in that in his last days I was there to take care of him, making sure to change his nappies. My grandmother passed away and I was there to take care of her. I remember those last moments as a moment of not just refuge, but a moment of knowing that someone somewhere was going through something much deeper. But every morning, I live my life with a simple rule. I wake up, I have a cup of coffee, I have conversations with people who will remind me that my life is real, that I am real. I don't have conversations with people who will make me believe that life after this moment, that life after tomorrow is not possible. Because I, every day, I need someone to remind me that I am real. My life is real and everything that I have survived is real. Betty's life is real too. Betty is my friend. <laughs> Hi, Betty. <laughs> Betty is my friend. Betty is from South Sudan. She is a refugee, and she is thriving. Betty is a mother, she is a sister, she is a friend. Betty is pregnant, heavily so. <laughs> but Betty is also a mom to a three-year-old toddler, and his name is Marcello. Marcello is possibly one of the brightest three-year-olds that I have ever encountered. And in their home, something beautiful hangs against the muddy walls. It is a heart-shaped tinsel that they made for Marcello when he was celebrating his third birthday. Kind of like Victoria in the south of the Hamptons, who has a stunning chandelier as soon as you enter her entrance hall, darling. Marcello does something very smart. Not something he invented, but I think he saw his mother do one too many times. Oh, that's Esther, by the way. The little girl? She's here. <laughs> Marcello does something smart, but I'm sure something that he didn't invent. Kind of saw maybe Betty do one too many times. He takes a rock and he opens the door and he places the rock against the door. It's nothing genius, 
but it's something so brilliant for a three-year-old. It speaks about his observance. Betty smiles and looks down at Marcello. She rubs her belly. She walks over to her neighbor's house, Elizabeth, and they speak about the brilliance of children. Kind of like Victoria, all the way in the Hamptons, who sees her son do something brilliant, and she shouts downstairs, oh, darling, oh, darling, come see your son. He's at it again. <laughs> Betty and her neighbor will speak about the menial things, about how well the vegetable garden is growing. Oh, how hot the sun is today. Maybe that day, potential donors will come to Betty's house, and they will ask and prod and look. They will look at Betty and they say, what do you need? And Betty will not ask for a car. Betty will not ask for a bicycle. She will not ask for curtains. She will not ask for a brand new king size bed. No. Betty will simply rub her belly and smile and say, All I need is for Esther to come out now because I need sleep. <laughs> but if you ask Betty's neighbor what she needs, she'll probably tell you, I need a solar light so that I can be able to see into my home because when it's dark, I keep bumping my things. And God forsake, if I bump my last bowl of sugar, kind of like Margaret in Mayfair, London, who experiences a, a power outage, and God forsake, if she bumps her favorite urn, all hell will break loose. <laughs> so you see, our challenges are different, yet they are the small things that make us so similar. Another refugee may ask for stronger connection for Wi-Fi. Another, his cushion. Please, a brand new one for my wheelchair because my bum bum is sore now. Because after the war, after the crises, after the tragedies, after the traumas, after everything has happened to us, life must go on because we are here. We must rebuild. We must restart. Have you driven through Kakuma? Have you seen the vibrancy? Have you seen the bright smiles? Have you seen the young little kids who wave at the cars and do funny things? Just that seed, that seed of life, that restoration of dignity to say we are people beyond the label. And so I would like to tell you about a community that I'm a part of. It's called Luku Luku. The word doesn't mean anything, please don't ask me. But I think somebody clever made it up. Luku Luku is an inter-African online community that seeks to lift the physical and mental borders, which are the true obstructions and the true objections to the togetherness that we seek, not only as Africans, but as global citizens. We want to lift the lid of invisibility. We want to shine the light of the everyday refugee, my brothers and sisters, my displaced kin. We want to change the narrative the narrative of even just the word, let alone the meaning of refugee. We believe that our common language, our common language is the ability to overcome. Our common language is resilience. Our common language is hope. Our common language is togetherness. But most importantly, our common language is L. O-V-E, love. And so we are here. We are here to say that our displaced brothers and sisters, our displaced kin, say, please don't walk into my muddy home and look at the walls with droopy eyes and sadness. No, do not miss the history because I have a portrait of my husband and I getting married. I have a heart-shaped tinsel that I made for my son when he turned three. Question me about that. Ask me about the fact that this home has birthed love, has birthed joy and laughter and turmoil and triumph. 
In fact, do me a favor, come to the stall at, my, at the market and buy a packet of mangoes. In fact, even if you're not gonna buy it from me, buy it from my neighbor, John. His look quite ripe today. <laughs> so he's giving me tough competition. Even if you're not going to eat those mangoes, or lest you contract some kind of disease in disease-ridden refugee camps. Support my effort in surviving. Support my effort in wanting to rebuild. Support my effort in having a new hope because a new dawn is here. And so I know, I know that there's a tendency for us to ask each other why we support certain causes. And I suppose I support this particular human experience, this particular human story, this particular human cause because I myself am somehow inherently a refugee. If you think about my grandmother who was abducted at a young age and forced into child marriage, and a couple of years down the line, she thought there's no way. There must be a new dawn somewhere and a new hope. And she ran away. And she started in a new land amongst a new tribe that was very averse to her kind and rebuilt. And that here I am, the generation that is still watering the tree of the seed that she planted. One of my favorite, favorite things about her and lessons that she taught me, she had a thing for broken mirrors. And of course, as a child, I'd say, but goko, why don't you just throw it away? What's the purpose of it? And she'd always say, pick up that mirror, look into it. Can you still see your reflection? And I'd say, yes. And so she'd say, you see, even in its broken form, it still serves its purpose. It still does what it must do. It can reflect an image and reflect a light. Dharma. Dharma is a Hindi word that means purpose. I believe strongly, fiercely, that my purpose is for this human cause. And I urge you today, I urge you today to think about a, a theater where a body is being, what do they do? <laughs> Operated on. Think of the bed, think of the sheets, think of the tools, think of the bowls, think of the water, think of the, the staff that is needed, think of the surgeon. Think of the wound. That body is humanity. I can only but hope that you don't think you don't serve a purpose in that room. You can be the tool that the surgeon needs to operate on that body, that body being humanity. You can be even the surgeon. I choose to be a surgeon for humanity. And so when we leave today, I hope that we remember to lift the lid of invisibility, to know and to believe that destitution will have to find a new home because it will not be in Africa anymore. I hope we believe in what Luku Luku stands for, that our common language is love. And I hope that we can lift, lift the borders of the mind and begin to see each other as one, as global citizens. And that our Dharma is more similar than we think, more than you think. So what's your purpose for being here? What role are you playing in the operating room? Goodbye, surgeons of humanity.